are getting hot out there. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I love you. I praise you, Lord. And I just, I just so thankful for you, God. Just, I think of that song, how great thou art, Lord God. You're so great. You're so mighty and you're so amazing. And I just love you. And I pray, Lord God, that you be here with us this morning. And I just pray, Lord, that we can, uh, just better understand your word that uh and that will apply these things to our lives that we learn in here lord and i pray you be with those who aren't here this morning lord and uh, watch over them comfort them lord heavenly father and uh we just love you and we praise you and uh your mighty name we pray amen all right so i'm going to be back in the book of daniel this morning uh last week i i was in the book of daniel talking about him and um I'm going to talk about him. I was talking about him and his little, his compadres that he had there, Meshach and uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. But today I want to look at it again because God, um, I love the book of Daniel. Just you see how God set him apart for such a great um, and, and an incredible purpose that he had on his life. And, um, and Daniel filled it um, very obediently and there, uh, that chapter 1, verse 8, kind of tells you a lot about Daniel before we get into where I'm going to be. But I wanted to read that verse, Daniel 1, 8. It says, But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with a portion of the king's delicies. And you know, um, Daniel, he was a determined young man. This here, Right here in uh, chapter 1, Daniel's a young man, right? He's been brought from... His homeland, he's been um, brought into exile. King uh, Nebuchadnezzar, he brings them into, he's brought them from their homeland. Daniel, his buddies, and he took all the, like I talked last week, he took all the good of the land, right? He took the young men, these um, the people of the noble family. But I love what it says there in chapter 8 where Daniel purposed in his heart. He was determined to follow God. No matter what, no matter what uh, King Nebuchadnezzar tried to name him, he tried to rename him, he tried to teach him, he tried everything. He was trying to take his identity from him, give him a new one. He was trying to indoctrinate him in his Babylonian uh, theology, I guess you could say. And they had to learn everything. It wasn't just like they learned the history and the, and the literature of the Babylonians, but that was also their mathematics and everything, astronomy, how they taught all that stuff. And, um, but I love what it says there. Daniel purposed in his heart. He was a determined young man and he chose to follow God. And that's why God used him so mightily. And, um, because of his faithfulness, he was able to do great things. God was able to do great things through him. Look at, um, there verses 19 through 21 says, then the king interviewed them and among them all, none was found like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Therefore they served before the king, and in all matters and in all matters of wisdom and understanding about which the king examined them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and astrologers who were in all his realm. Thus Daniel continued until the first year of King Cyrus. You see that? Daniel and these boys, he says they were ten times better than everybody else. Ten times. I mean, God used him for great, great great things and um you know you um so not only so god uses him for these great things and it says there at the end thus daniel continued until the first year of king cyrus so when you look at daniel's life and you think about it he started out the babylonians are the one who invaded judah right and brought these people back to exile so he's in here. He's going to be in this captivity. It's like a 70 years of captivity. Jeremiah prophesies about it. And he goes through two Babylonian kings. And then Babylonian gets overtaken by the Medo-Persian Empire. And he ends up serving under Darius and Cyrus. And I think about this. The whole time he's in this, he went from Judah. He goes to Babylonia. And he's, he's serving God, right? He dedicates his life to God. To serving God, he's up in a high, high-ranking position in the um, Babylonian Empire. Then the Medo-Persian Empire comes in, invades Babylonian. He goes and he serves under Darius and Cyrus, and he's still in these high positions. 
That's amazing. It's amazing how God used him in all these places. Even with that switch of power and everything, um, he still stayed in those positions of power. And the reason why is because he dedicated himself to God. He purposed in his heart not to defile himself and, um, and, and to serve God. And I'm not going to make it all the way to... Uh, um, get to Cyrus today, but we're going to make it uh, to his predecessor, Darius, and I'm going to be in chapter 6, and we're going to look at the story of the lion's den, and um, just how Daniel, how, how he remained faithful and, uh, and served God. So here in uh, Daniel chapter 6, verses 1 through 5, it says, It pleased Darius to set over the kingdom 120 satraps, to be over the whole kingdom. And over these three governors, of whom Daniel was one, that the satraps might give account to them, so that the king would suffer no loss. Then this Daniel distinguished himself above the governors and satraps, because an excellent spirit was in him, and the king gave thought to setting him over the whole realm. So the governors and satraps, so the governors and satraps, um, sought to find some charges against Daniel concerning the kingdom, but they could not find no charge or fault because he was faithful, nor was there any error or fault found in him. Then these men said, We shall not find any charge against this Daniel unless we find it against him concerning the law of his God. So, King Darius, right here you see, he's wanting to set Daniel up. He's already a governor but he's wanting to set him up. He's like, I want this guy to be second in command because of how, how wise he was, the wisdom that he had, the knowledge he had, his faithfulness. He's like, I want to set him up. I want him to be second in charge. Now, like I said earlier, it amazes me how he went through these empires, but also the fact that, you know, Daniel, this is he's just a refugee boy is what he was. He was and he was stolen out of his own country. And to get to where he's at in one of these pagan countries is just amazing. And um, and it's all because of his faithfulness and his uh, dedication to God. And Daniel's entire life, it, up to this point, it's like I said, it's all been spent in, in positions of power and leadership. His, his whole life has. And, um, and you might say, well, how can this be? So if you look at chapter 4, verse... Verses uh, eight through eight through nine, it says, "But at last Daniel came before me. His name is Belteshazzar, according to the name of my God. In him is the spirit of the holy God. And I told the dream before him, saying, Belteshazzar, chief of the magicians, because I know that the spirit of the holy God is in you, and no secret troubles you. You explain, and no secret troubles you. Explain to me the visions of my dream that I have seen." And its interpretation. Then look at chapter 5 verses 11 through 12. It said. There is a man in your kingdom. In whom the spirit of the holy God. Or in whom is the spirit of the holy God. And in the days of our father. And the days of your father. Light and understanding and wisdom. Like the wisdom of the gods were found in him. And King Nebuchadnezzar your father. Your, your father the king. Made him chief of the magicians. Astrologers. Chaldeans and soothsayers and as much as an excellent spirit knowledge understanding interpreting dreams solving riddles and explaining enigmas were found in this daniel whom the king named Bel belteshazzar now let daniel be called and he will give the interpretation and then there's six three says then this daniel distinguished himself above the governors and satraps because an excellent spirit was in him you see that these verses show us that the Holy Spirit would indwell and fill Daniel, and that, that gave him this supernatural power or ability to do the stuff that he did. That's what made him stand out. It wasn't that he was awesome or that he was some cool guy or he was super smart. He had the Spirit of God in him. That's what set him apart from everybody else. Is that it was the Holy Spirit of God. And, um, uh, and, and that's what sets Christians apart from the rest of the world. Is the fact, right? God, had, he's... He's given us a new spirit. We're born again in Jesus Christ. And that's what sets us apart from the world around us. And that's what set Daniel apart from the world around him, from society around him, from the people that were around him. And uh, 
And Daniel was dedicated to use this supernatural relationship and, and the abilities that God gave him to glorify God in everything that he did. And you see it as you read through his story. His whole life, he's glorifying God. He's pr he, he prays all the time. He's a very devout man of prayer. You read through the book of Daniel and he's always praying. He's a praying man. He loves God and he's determined in his heart to follow him. And, um, uh, and he was dedicated to him. And, you know, I, uh, I I think about that, you know, Daniel's dedication to God and uh, and just, just the heart that he had for God. Through all that he went through and all that he had seen, he followed God's leading for over 60-some years, 70 years, and he never wavered in his faith. He went through all, he was stolen out of his country as a boy, went through all them different empires, and he never wavered in his faith to he was dedicated to serve God. He understood, look, God's given me this gift. He's given me these abilities. They all come from God, and you see that in there. Because without the Spirit of God, he wouldn't have been able to do all this stuff. And, and he was determined not to waste the um, gift that God had, God had given. And we need to be the same way. You know, God's given us a great gift in empowering us with the Holy Spirit and giving us his Holy Spirit. And also, you know, just think about the grace that God gives you. God's grace and, and just the things that he gives us. We should never waste those things. We have to be dedicated to use those things for God's glory and uh, uh, and pass them on to others. And so uh, so we see these satraps. So Daniel, right, he has the spirit of God in him. He's proven himself above everybody else. And these governors, um, when, when these go, when these other guys, I, I'm just gonna call them as adversaries. When they see all that's going on with Daniel, they're they're kind of got a jealous spirit in them, I guess you could say. So they they want to come against him. They're like, okay, we're gonna tear this dude down. We're gonna tear down his reputation. But they couldn't find any fault in him. It says they could not find one bit of fault in him. And you know, I think about that. Can we say the same thing about ourselves when people come fault finding? What do they What do they see? What What would they find? Would um, Would they come to the same conclusion that they came to with Daniel? That there ain't nothing we can find fault in this guy. Like he's faithful to his God. He's faithful. It says that he was faithful. He wasn't just faithful to God, but he was also faithful to the king. Right? He served him like he was supposed to. Um, and it says they could not find any fault with him. And And you know. The same thing, uh, listen what Revelation 12, 10 says. It says, Then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now salvation and strength in the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brethren who accused them before our God day and night has been cast down. You see that? Just like Daniel, you got these guys. Daniel's doing everything he's supposed to do serving God and being faithful and um, being a man of integrity and all that stuff and you got his adversaries coming over here being like hey we got to find some fault in this dude we got to find something that's the same thing it says Satan does it says he accused them day and night before God he goes before God look at look at so and so doing this doing that and uh, 1 Peter 3 13 through 17 says this and who is he who will harm you if you become followers of what is good but even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you are blessed. And do not be afraid of their threats, nor be troubled. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. That sounds like Daniel. He's sanctified. He set God apart in his heart. And it says, And always be ready to give an offense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Having a good conscience, listen, that when they defame you as evildoers, those who revile your good conduct, in Christ may be ashamed. You see that? He's, this, is, this has to do with your testimony and who you are before the world. Just like Daniel. These people are out there trying to fault find. People are going to do it with you. They're going to put your life under a microscope. Some people will. They will put your life under a microscope when they know that you love Jesus Christ. Or when, um, or that you have faith in Christ. People will. And some people will nitpick it to death. They'll try to find any fault they can in but that's where you have to set Christ apart in your hearts. Set him apart in your hearts and live, live for Jesus. And I'm telling you, he tells you right there. If you'll sanctify Christ, 
Lord God in your hearts. And always, he says, always be ready to give a defense for the people who ask. And when they defame you as evildoers, those who revile your good conduct in Christ may be ashamed. You know, uh, another thing I think about when I think about, uh, you've probably heard somebody say that before, like if somebody ever took you to court for being a Christian, would they find you guilty of the charges, right? There's a lot of people who would. If they examined your whole life in a court setting to say you're guilty of being a Christian, would they be able to call you guilty if they examined your whole life and went through it? come through it. Yes, people can find little stuff to nitpick, but we have to live for Jesus Christ. We have to love Him. We have to be dedicated to Him, and we have to set Him apart in our hearts. And um, and and these men, I love here the fact that since they couldn't find no fault in Daniel, they couldn't find anything wrong with his life, look what they do. We shall not find any charge against this Daniel unless we find it against him concerning the law of his God. Since they couldn't get his life or who he was, they're like, okay, we're going to attack his relationship with God. This has been going on for ages. This is, And this is what I'm telling you. If people can't find fault in you, they're going to try to find some fault with your relationship with God. They will attack that. And, um, and like I said, it's, it's been going on throughout history and it's still going on today. Look at Matthew 5, 11 and 12. It says, blessed are you when they revile you and persecute you. And say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Jesus said that's what they're going to do. He said when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. They can't, we can't get at you so we're going to attack your relationship with Christ. That's where we're going to have to hit things. He says rejoice and be exceedingly glad for great is your reward in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. So... So we see them, they're attacking Daniel uh, because they're jealous of him because of the position he has. So these men set the trap for Daniel and, uh, and they go to deceive King Darius to establish their scheme. So look at uh, verse 6, it says, So these governors and satraps thronged before the king and said thus to him, King Darius, live forever. All the governors of the kingdom, the administrators and satraps, the counselors and advisors have consulted together to establish a royal statute and to make a firm decree that whoever petitions any god or man for 30 days except you, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions. Now, O king, establish the decree and sign the writing so that it cannot be changed according to the law of the Medes and Persians, which does not alter. Therefore, King Darius signed the written decree. You see this? We can't find no fault in Daniel. We're going to attack his relationship with God. So they go to the king and they're like, hey, we need to set this up. We need to write up this decree that if anybody worships anything, they're going in the lion's den. So, um, so the king signs it. And like it says there, when the Medes or when the Medes and Persians made a law, there was no the king, it don't matter how bad he wanted to, you could not go against it at all. It was, it was established, and that's what it was. And, um, uh, and like I said, they're, they're just coming up with this scheme against them. And I thought of Ephesians 6, 11, where it says, Put on the whole armor of God so that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. So Daniel, he's, he's one of these guys, so he knows this decree has come down. So this is coming against his relationship with God. He knows it. And, um, uh, so Daniel, he has to make a decision here. Either quit following God and shrink back or continue in obedience to God and face death. And I would, I think kind of, you know, what, what would we do? If you knew that decree come down, if they said, look, if y'all meet together as Christians, we're coming and we're chopping heads off. What would you do? And it's, and that's a hard one because it would be, I want to say that I know that I would still meet with Christians and I would still have church. But if I could see, and a lot of people would feel this way, how could we get around this? You know what I mean? It, it would make you want to kind of go silence or shrink back. It would. Because that would be scary if you knew, like, hey, if, if I go meet together with you guys, there's a chance we could all be killed. And that's what it is. 
and and God wants He wants us to meet together. And you know, whenever I look at this, I think of those churches like in China and these different countries where they have these super um, super harsh laws against people gathering in the name of Jesus Christ and having church. When they put these laws in place, though, it's amazing how much those churches grow. They grow. It's it's crazy how how Christianity just blows up in countries like that when these people have to go undercover and they still they're meeting together and um it's it's just neat now i want you to look at what daniel does um look at verses 10 through 11 it says now when daniel knew that the writings were signed he went home and in his upper room with his windows open toward jerusalem he knelt down on his knees three times that day and prayed and gave thanks before his god as was his custom since early days so Daniel knows, like I said, full well what the law is, but he chooses to keep on serving God. He's like, I'm going to keep on doing what I do. I'm going to keep on with my relationship with God. He doesn't shrink back or fall back. And, you know, notice, in, notice what it says there in verse uh, 10, though. It says, as was his custom since early days. You know, Daniel didn't do this just to be rebellious like we see today. Have you ever seen people who... Uh, how can I say it? I was thinking about some of this stuff the other day. It's kind of like when they took a prayer out of school and, and you got these people going crazy. You know, they're like, oh my goodness, it's so bad. And that is dumb. Why, why are you taking prayer out of school? I understand. But then you'll have these people never went up to the school and tried to pray or have a prayer meeting with the kids or nothing. And now all of a sudden that there's a law against it, we're going to be up there doing something, right? It's like a rebellious spirit in them. They don't necessarily do it for God. They're doing it because, um, because of rebellion. It's like now that you put a law on it, now I'll speak up and I'll do something about it. But if there ain't no law on it, I wasn't going to do nothing anyways. But now that there's a law, I'll start acting a fool. But Daniel, that's not why he does it. He doesn't have a rebellious, a rebellious heart as some today would. He didn't wait for the law to come and then start praying. He already did this. It tells you it was his custom since early days. He'd been doing this stuff. This is what he's been doing. He didn't wait for a law to come down and then start being like, oh my goodness. He'd been praying way before this. And um, and I love how the fact that he just keeps on, uh, continues to glorify God the same way that he had been doing it for these 60 years. And he wasn't going to conform to the king's edicts or laws and uh, um that forbade him to have a relationship with God. And it's the same thing. I'll never tell nobody to rebel against the government, but if they come out with laws that affect my relationship with God, I'll forfeit. I mean, it is what it is. You, nothing, we can't allow anything to come between our relationship with the Lord. None of us can. That's where you have to take a stand. And, um, and like I said, Daniel continues to pray and he ends up in a lot of trouble. They're in a, um, verse 14 it says and the king when he had heard these words was greatly displeased with himself and set his heart on Daniel to deliver him and he labored till the going down of the sun to deliver him so you see here king um, King Darius he's like man I want to deliver this dude but like I said whenever these Medes and Persians signed a law that was the law but it says then these men approached the king and said to the king Know, O king, that it is the law of the Medes and the Persians that no decree or statute with the king which the king establishes may be changed. So the king gave the command, and they brought Daniel and cast him into the den of lions. But the king spoke, saying to Daniel, Your God, whom you serve continually, he will deliver you. Then a stone was brought and laid on the mouth of the den, and the king sealed it with his own signet ring and with the signets of the, his lords that the purpose concerning Daniel might not be changed. I, you know, no matter how hard that king tried, there ain't nothing that he could do to get Daniel out of there. And going on to verse eight, 18, it says, Now the king went <coughs> to his palace and spent the night fasting, and no musicians were brought before him. Also his sleep went from him. Then the king arose very early in the morning and went in haste to the den of lions. And when he came to the den, he cried out with a lamenting voice to Daniel. 
the king spoke, saying to Daniel, Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God, whom you serve continually, been able to deliver you from the lions? Then Daniel said to the king, O king, live forever. My God sent his angels and shut the lions' mouths so that they have not hurt me because I was found innocent before him. And also, O king, I have done no wrong before you. Now the king was exceedingly glad for him and commanded that they should take Daniel up out of the den. So Daniel was taken up out of the den and no injury whatever was found on him because he believed in his God. That's an amazing story. I love the question Darius pretty much asked him there. Was, he pretty much asked him, was God able to deliver you? Was he, was he able to deliver you? I couldn't do it. Was your God able to deliver you? And, um, and we see that God did. And it says, why did God deliver him? Because he believed in his God. There at the end of that um, verse 23, because he believed in his God. And we have to understand that um, when Daniel refused to shut his mouth, God shut the mouth of his adversaries, right? When he refused to lay down his relationship with God, God, he shut the mouth of his adversaries because he was dedicated to God, he was faithful to God, and God protected him, and he'll do that for all the saints. Anybody who loves God, believes in him, and fully trusts their life with him, he will protect them and watch over them. And you know, we might not ever get thrown into a den of lions, but you might be surprised if I told you we live in one now. We do. That's, this right here, remind, it, whenever I think of Daniel being thrown in that den of lions, I think of the world that we live in today for a Christian. 1 Peter 5, 8, 9 says, Be of a sober spirit, be on the alert. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion. And that's what he does. He prowls around like a roaring lion, and it says he's seeking someone to devour so resist him firm in your faith, knowing that the same experience of suffering are being accomplished by your brothers and sisters who are in the world. And uh, 2 Corinthians 4, 3 and 4 says, And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, and in whose case the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelieving so that they will not see the light of the gospel, the glory of Christ, who is the, Im who is the image of God. You know, this world is Satan's playground. It is, and he's powerful. A lot of people, um, they they think, uh, they don't realize how powerful Satan really is. And he, he does have a lot of power. I'm not going to boast on him or try to lift him up on some pedestal, but he does. He has a lot of power. And, um, and like these verses say, he's like a roaring lion and he's the God of this world. And, um, and, and we cannot in our own strength or with anybody else's strength, deliver ourselves or anyone else from him. I can't deliver somebody from Satan, and you can't deliver me from him. But however, there is a God in heaven, the Lion of Judah, who has crushed his head, and he will shut his mouth, and he will protect you from all the schemes and everything else that he brings against you. But you have to be faithful to him, I'm telling you. I think a lot of people trip them own selves up because they're disobedient to God. They don't follow him like they should. They, they don't, uh, they're not sensitive to God's leading in their lives and they just live however they want. And then they wonder why they're always under attack and they can't ever get ahead. It's because they're not faithful to God. Like Daniel was, he was so faithful to God that he, uh, that God protected him. He, he always was, uh, in that right position with God. And God looked out for him. And like it says, he shut the mouth of them lions. And he'll do the same for us if we trust him and, um, and obey him. And, and, you know, we must understand that the power to shut the mouths of our adversary comes solely from the God that we faithfully worship and serve. And if we trust and obey him, we can be delivered just like Daniel. Each and every one of us. Because Satan, he's out there, like it says, he's a roaring lion. He's out there roaring and looking for somebody to devour. And you know, whenever he, I guess you could say, pulls our card, if we're walking with God, it ain't gonna matter. He done crushed his head. He done gave us the victory. We have victory in Jesus Christ over the devil, over his minions, over death and all that stuff. And, uh, we need to cling to him and trust him and be faithful and dedicated to him like Daniel was. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I love you, Lord, and I pray, Father, that each and every one of us will
have a dedicated heart, Lord God. I pray that the world will look at our relationship that we have with you, kind of like Darius did here in this story with Daniel, where it says twice he said, you're God who you continually serve. That's such a testimony, Lord God. Darius seen and he knew Daniel continually served God, and he did it out in public and in the middle of a pagan world that served all these false gods, Lord. And, uh, I just pray that we'll do the same thing in the world that we're in today, Father, and, uh, that we'll serve you faithfully, be dedicated to you, Lord God, and be sensitive to the leading of the Holy Spirit. And, uh, just help us, Lord God. And, uh, like that song said earlier, great art thou, Father, and you're so great and mighty, and I pray that you watch over each and every person in here, that you bless them and keep them safe and bring us back here safely this evening. In the name of Jesus, we pray.